So it's, in, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce you to uh, Nervous System, to the lecture. Uh, it's uh, Jessica uh, Rosenkranz and Jesse Louis Rosenberg are here, not for the first time, so welcome back. Uh, it's been roughly six years that they, and together with Lay, were here invited for previous MRS, gave workshops, and I'm sure that some of the students that listened to your workshop uh, back in the days are now here continuing the research. So great to have you back here. Actually, there's not so much need for introduction. You all know Nervous Systems. Nervous Systems Design has been featured in a wide range of publications, Wired, New York Times, Guardian, Forbes. Also, their work uh, is shown in famous museums like Museum of Modern Art, uh, uh, Smithsonian Design Museum, or Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. Nervous System is a generative design studio that works at the intersection of science, art, and technology. Founded in 2007 by Jessica Rosenkranz and Jesse Louis Rosenberg, Nervous System releases online design applications that enable customers to co-create products in an effort to make design more accessible. And that's really also something very specific. I think already 2007 or so, there was, or, or a bit later, there were online, real online applications where people could design uh, uh, small-scale objects and then also fabricate them and order them online. And I think this business is still going on. So also in the sense of uh, um, uh, really um, uh, uh, open design tool, uh, this is uh, very innovative always. And we encounter the works of uh, uh, nervous system everywhere. We recently had a visit from uh, New Balance and they showed us already uh, fantastic design tools that you programmed for them. That's also something very specific about this design studio. They don't uh, just work with existing algorithms or with, with existing CAD software, but from the very beginning, you always programmed your own software. And that uh, makes you very special in the field of the computational design. Also. Drawing inspiration from natural phenomena, nervous system write computer programs based on processes and patterns found in nature and use those programs to create unique and affordable art, jewelry, and housewares. So maybe I can give a, a quick uh, uh, story. I met uh, Jesse already uh, some years ago when I was working in Toronto and I wanted to invite her to Toronto. And it's difficult to get them, of course. So she said maybe the Toronto Ripley's Aquarium would be something interesting to, to get her there. Now the trick to get you both to Zurich was to, uh, to talk about the succulenten uh, collection that we have here in the Botanical <laughs> Garden, which we'll be soon visit. But now please let's all welcome Nervous System. And let's enter their botanical garden. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Benjamin, for the introduction. And thank you, Tyus, for inviting us here. Yes, you said we were here in 2010, so almost eight years ago now. And it's great to see this impressive new space and your workshop where you're building these giant projects. It's all extremely impressive and grandiose in scale. And actually, when we were here last time, we were working on these projects based on reaction diffusion, which is a chemical signaling process that people use to simulate how a lot of sort of biological patterns form, whether it's sort of patterns on fish, or even the differentiation of parts of your body, like the number of digits you have. And we taught a workshop kind of focused on this, so we kind of showing how you use these simulation techniques and how you can create three-dimensional objects from them. And this is a series of cups that we created using reaction diffusion. And the funny thing is that we're actually now revisiting this project eight years later that we just started one or two months ago. So previously, this was sort of our only foray into traditional mass production, where we created these cups and they were manufactured in China, ordered thousands of quantities that we had to get shipped. And now we're switching to producing it in-house. So this isn't any sort of fancy robotic manufacturing. It's just traditional ceramic slip casting. We've built out a small ceramic studio. We're sort of learning about mold making and 
clay and glaze chemistry and all of these sort of very traditional craft things. And the only sort of digital fabrication aspect of this is that we're 3D printing the mold parts, which are actually the mold positives. And then when you do slip casting, you create rubber master molds from these positives. Those rubber master molds then make plaster molds. Plaster molds are porous, so they absorb moisture out of the clay, which is how slip casting works, and you get a hollow form. And then, so that is finally fired in a kiln. There's, I guess just, we just wanted to start with that because there's a weird synchronicity for us that we were here like eight years ago, which feels like almost my entire life ago. And we were working on this one project that has to do with making slip cast porcelain. And somehow eight years later, we get an invitation to come here again. And we just started working on the exact same project. <laughs> somehow, it just works out that strange way. <laughs> So we started our studio, uh, as Benjamin said, back in 2007. We were both still students. Uh, I was studying biology and architecture, and Jesse was studying math and computer science. Uh, and we kind of wanted to do projects that mashed up these different disciplines together. But we didn't really find a way to do that in school. Um, our weird experiments were not very well received or respected by our instructors. So nervous system became a place where we could make these bizarre combinations of disciplines that at the time didn't seem very interrelated. Um, and then somehow we ended up turning that into a business. So on the surface of it, Nervous System is sort of a product design studio. We primarily make a variety of different kind of everyday objects from jewelry to lighting, jigsaw puzzles, sometimes things on the scale of furniture or installations. And we're working with different materials like wood, stainless steel, plastic, rubber. But really what unites our work isn't sort of these different products or mediums, but kind of the computational process that goes behind them. So our medium isn't any of these materials, but is really computation. Our projects uh, often start from some sort of natural phenomenon that we become slightly obsessed with. Our hyphae project, also from 2010, uh, was inspired by how veins form in leaves. So we start a project like this sort of looking at scientific research for how scientists have tried to model the formation of veins in the past. And this project is based off some research from uh, somebody named Adam Runyon's at the University of Calgary. And we sort of took this base idea of an algorithm and then started to ask, how can we adapt this for design? We're not necessarily interested in mimicking the exact forms or structures that we see in nature, but understanding their logic and kind of maybe abstracting that, expanding it into design processes. Although leaf veination is really a flat two-dimensional process, leaves are only like a couple of cells high, we decided to think about how we'd apply the same algorithmic framework to something that's three-dimensional. Um, so we started doing these sketches that are further away from the initial inspiration, but started to suggest new ways you could apply this algorithm for making uh, sort of space-filling structures. And so we use these tools to, to then design products. So this is a series of lamps that we created where every single one is one of a kind. And then they're 3D printed in nylon using selective laser centering. So in order to produce designs that are all one of a kind, obviously that drew our studio towards focusing more specifically on tools like digital fabrication, which you guys are the kings of here, where it's pretty easy to make things all different. Uh, so we have these stereotypical things that people say about 3D printing, laser cutting, uh, robotic fabrication even, that complexity is free and variation is free and it's lowering the barriers to creation, which is one of the things we're really most excited about is seeing these tools proliferate so more people have the option to uh, make things in their lives that are of high quality. Uh, but the thing that we sort of identified as a studio that's kind of missing in this equation is actually the software. 
Um, so while we have these powerful machines now, like in every public library in the US and people have them in their garage, like how do you actually communicate with the machine? How do you tell it what you want it to make? It can make anything, but only if you can design that thing and communicate it. Um, so we, in our practice, have focused a lot on looking at how to, wake, how to make new types of design experiences. So one example of that is an online application we created called Cell Cycle, which is for making customized jewelry, rings, bracelets, or abstract art objects, as some of the things that people order from us appear to be. Can't really say what they are. And so this is a JavaScript application, so it just runs natively in the browser. It's all WebGL, and you can kind of playfully customize sort of one of the principles that we kind of guides our work is trying to create design experiences that are open-ended enough that people can really play and explore, but also constrained enough that they're kind of an identifiable product that anybody without design experience can jump in and create something and they don't have to worry about the manufacturing constraints or things like that. Uh, our design processes are obviously very inspired by the complex dynamic processes that we see in nature. Um, these processes kind of grow and adapt to different conditions, and the resultant forms are really fascinating in that they become expressions of the conditions that generated them and the logic behind that. Computers are often toted as offering all of these new ways of making things, but design software tends to be pretty... Uh, practically designed to be a kind of strange digital analog of how we work with physical materials and physical tools. So it's a screenshot from Photoshop. We're working with a palette knife to scrape a photo and have it have a painting-like effect. Um, it's not really that much new happening with most CAD software. Our work at Nervous System tries to offer a kind of different direction, taking inspiration from nature's process-based designs. We're focusing on developing interactive tools um, that people can really engage with. So instead of creating static designs uh, or products that are mass manufactured, we really focus on creating dynamic systems that our customers can interact with. And instead of drawing structures, we're very interested in growing them. So we're going to talk a bit more in depth about a couple projects, and the first one is floor form. And it sort of starts with this idea of how do biological structures create form and pattern? You know, so the typical idea is you start with a single cell, and it divides and grows. And somehow, starting from this uniform initial condition, you get all the things that we see. And so one of the principles that we look at is called differential growth, which is this very simple idea of if you have things that grow at different rates in different locations, how do you create shape? And how is that growth controlled? So an example of this that you see commonly in nature is plant tropisms. So plants can grow or bend towards different environmental conditions. And sort of an explanation of that is you can have a gradient of growth that responds to a gradient from the environment, like a gradient of light. So in this example, a stem bends towards light by growing more on one side than the other. And you can extend the same sort of idea to a surface where if one side of the surface bends, you get curvature, or one side of the surface grows, you get curvature. And this project started for us when we came across research from a professor at Harvard named Mahadevan that was looking at the shape of leaves and flowers, where he proposed this model of differential growth where these structures could be explained by sort of the simple idea of growing more towards the edge. And what was interesting about this to us is that unlike these other models of differential growth where you sort of have a one-to-one -one relationship between growth and shape, you, know, you grow on one side, you get a bend. Here, you have very 
complex shapes with all sorts of curvature and ruffles, but you don't need a complex growth to explain that. It's very simple growth, just grow more towards the edge. If you look outside in nature, you take a walk in the forest, you're going to see these sort of growth patterns all over the place, the edge of flower petals, lettuce leaves, uh, succulents, um, sort of all over the place. You start to broaden your view a little bit, you see this uh, basic growth pattern essentially in every branch of the tree of life. We have jellyfish, anemones, sea slugs, bryozoans, cacti, different types of fungi, coral, they all have forms that seem like they could be described by this very simple growth process. This guy is my favorite, and I always throw it in every lecture just so everybody learns about them. They are an animal called the lettuce sea slug, or Elysia crispata, which have a really strange way of making their living. They live on coral reefs in the Caribbean, and they have these innate, uh, ornate, crazy ruffles on their back, which at first might seem totally impractical, like what are they doing with all these ruffles? However, they're totally functional space-filling structures because what they do is they eat algae and they rip out the chloroplast from the algae, which is the photosynthesizing mechanism, and they insert that into the ruffle on their back. And the ruffle on their back essentially becomes like a solar farm that they move around the reef with. Um, so with more ruffles, they can farm more sugar, and then they're totally self-sustaining insane solar-powered sea slug farms. Oh, and that's also called kleptoplasty, which is just a really cool word. It means they eat by stealing. Another favorite example of things that have these ruffly structures is this flower uh, called coxcomb. In the US, at least, it's very commonly seen uh, in the form on the right, which is another like bizarrely ruffled shape. Um, but this is actually a mutant form. It doesn't want to look like that. It's supposed to look like the flower on the left. It's supposed to be this sort of fluffy Christmas tree type growth. And what has happened is a mutation called fasciation, which actually happens all across plants. Um, plants typically have one growing point called the apical meristem. And this has sort of growth hormone that's being secreted that suppresses other areas from growing and branching. So as this one area that wants to grow and branch, Sometimes there's a mutation there, though, and instead of growing and branching at the apical meristem, it just continues lengthening, and it never branches. And as it lengthens and lengthens and lengthens, it starts to make really weird things that look like this uh, crested flower. Um, so after reading that weird paper by Mahadevan about how lilies bloom and looking at these uh, crested plants, we started to think about building a simulation that would let us explore kind of the space in between what happens when you have something that's growing in a sort of branching form and then begins to make this sort of weird crested form. It's something you can't really do actually physically in nature, but digitally we can build a simulation that lets us explore the potential sort of morphogenetic space in between this tree and this insane ruffled flower. Which is a very long introduction to this project, but <laughs> that gives you a sense of how we think and why we do these sort of projects, hopefully. So we started to build out this system and test kind of different scenarios. So this is the base case of undifferentiated growth. It just grows the same everywhere. And instead of just expanding and sort of just scaling up, because it's this thin membrane, it actually creates this kind of roughly, not roughly, but convoluted blob. And so here are a bunch of surfaces where they're all the same surface, but they have different sort of growth modes. So the, this one is an expanding line, sort of inspired by mutated cacti, and this is sort of a typical branching growth where it has a point, and then that point splits, and it naturally forms branches as the growth separates. And finally is kind of this initial inspiration of edge-based growth, where it grows more at the edge and creates these ruffled forms. Throughout all the animations we're gonna show you in this section, red is the rate that that triangle is growing in the mesh, so. It's just all of them have the same material properties, just different speeds lead to the different forms. So underneath this whole system, we have a physics simulation that's based on discrete she elastic shells, where we have a triangulation that adaptively subdivides as it grows and needs to become more detailed. There's a collision system that prevents it from intersecting itself, which sort of looks like a bunch of alien eggs. <laughs> And then we set up sort of different scenarios that can change properties through space. 
So I describe part of our practice almost as a kind of digital gardening. Um, the things that we're making look like plants, but we're not really making plants. We're sort of growing algorithms and figuring out ways to interact with them so we can kind of craft systems around them. It's uh, kind of interesting to work with the innate behavior of the system, but you're also creating the system so you can really build in all of these types of uh, manipulations and controls that allow you to really direct what it's doing. But there's still some surprising things that occur. These are a few of the different uh, end effectors that we have in the system that allow us to control what it's doing. There's material things like the bend strength and the stretch strength of the underlying material. Uh, there's environmental conditions like gravity, for instance. There's anisotropic uh, control over what direction it's growing. And all of these things together let us somewhat shape and control what it's doing. And the, the largest primary thing we control is the zones of growth. So where is it growing from and at what speed, which is shown as the color gradients in these animations. This one is looking at changing the thickness of the surface as it grows. So we translate some of these digital experiments into physical objects. Uh, these are sculptures that we produce using selective laser sintering. Uh, these ones were produced using the old school Z-Core method of color printing, um, where we're just looking at encoding the rates of growth on the surface as colors, and then uh, producing some physically animated sculptures inspired by 19th century zoetropes, so you can have something in a gallery that really shows the 3D property of growing, uh, rather than showing an animation. And so at Nervous System, we do these sort of research and experiments, but we disseminate these ideas as affordable objects. So we use the system to grow a line of jewelry where sort of each piece is kind of a crafted simulation where we've designed a specific surface and a specific growth scenario for each piece. And then once again, they're 3D printed. These are in nylon, and these are printed in wax and then cast using lost wax casting in silver or other precious metals. So we sort of like this idea that you know, products can embody complex ideas. You don't need to have these sort of things just in research papers or at academic institutions. You can have a product where it can be just a beautiful object, but it can also be something that is inspiring or leads to sort of more lines of inquiry. Okay, so the second project that we're gonna talk about in a small amount of detail or, or larger amount of detail is called Kinematics. And it's a little bit a different direction of research for us in the project we just talked about, which focuses much more on our inspiration with nature. This project focuses more on our interest in developing uh, accessible web-based tools for co-creation um, and looking at sort of the intersection of that with fashion. So we started to think about how 3D printers could be used to create new types of textiles, which can sound sort of strange at first since 3D printers make kind of hard, kind of monolithic objects usually, but it also sort of makes a lot of sense because textiles aren't really natural materials. They're really human constructed materials. You know, the raw material itself has less of an effect on how it behaves than how it's arranged in space. So whether it's woven or knit is more important than whether it's cotton or wool. And so we can sort of start to think about 3D printing as a way of creating even more complex arrangements of material in space. And how can we use that to kind of create things that have variable properties that change throughout their structure? And in fact, Textiles have a long history with computation. So the, the Jacquard loom is sort of an early precursor to the first computer that used punch cards to encode complex weaving structures. And so we can think of textiles as traditionally computationally mediated materials. So this project sort of explores a hinge-based 3D printed textile. 3D printers often create rigid materials, but by structuring that material uh, as in interlocking configuration, we can create things that start to behave a bit more like textiles. We wanted to create a textile that could be highly variable in its properties, so could vary in rigidity, porosity, uh, drape and shape throughout space. 
Um, and we started to play with making pretty small structures like the ones that are currently wiggling around on the screen. These ones were originally designed to be jewelry pieces. And the reason we were making things that are jewelry pieces uh, is because we have a small 3D printer. At the time we had a MakerBot Replicator 1, which is like the plywood box replicator, and we were printing some of these things. And it took up essentially the entire uh, build volume of our machine. Um, and they were pretty cool, actually, because they're a little bit like a weird material. They're not really like textiles. They're not really like monolithic fabric. They're kind of or monolithic uh, sculpture material. They're a weird hybrid between soft and hard things. And we started to think about like, you're really cool to make a larger structure out of these weird hybrid soft hard things. Um, I particularly started dreaming about making a dress. I had seen a lot of other 3D printed dresses and none of them really were what I would want to wear. Um, and I started to think about making a dress for myself out of this weird material. Um, but how could we do that? We were making things about the size of a necklace because that's how big our printer is. How could we make a bigger thing? So a lot of projects uh, in digital fabrication, we make a bigger thing by dividing it down into a bunch of discrete parts. Um, let's say a thousand unique bricks. And those thousand unique bricks then need to be arranged and uh, constructed into a final object which ends up being very laborious uh, because now instead of having a thousand identical bricks, you have a thousand unique bricks. We came up with an idea um, that maybe we could short circuit that problem and actually make our thing all as one piece um, by doing what you're seeing on the screen now, folding it up into a smaller configuration. Uh, so the task we set ourselves was can we come up with a simulation that will allow us to computationally compress the structures we're making uh, so they can be made all in one piece. Since the structures we're making are intended to be flexible at the end, why not just find a smaller configuration to make them in and then print them and unfurl them from the printer into one larger object? Um, once we started thinking about that, that sort of like changes the whole way you think about making clothing in general. Because clothing is traditionally made from flat sheets, which are um, cut into specific shapes and then laboriously reconstructed through sewing complicated 3D seam lines into a garment that has a specific shape. If you can print it with the shape already embedded in the material, then you can start to propose a different direction of making clothing where you go directly from, let's say, a 3D scan to a web application where you could customize the design fully in 3D and then produce it again um, fully in 3D. So to achieve this, we sort of have to solve all of these different problems with the fabrication, how do we design it, how do we make it fit a body, and how do we do this compression to make it all in one piece. And so if you forgive the pun, part of this project hinges just on hinges. So we're making this structure, it's made of thousands of little hinges, and so we end up spending an inordinate amount of time just kind of designing 3D printed hinges. And you know, for every sort of different 3D printing process, a different hinge type is sort of more appropriate. A hinge that works printed, you know, in one orientation flat doesn't necessarily work if you print it vertically. And so there ends up being kind of this very lengthy process of trying to get the sort of our ideal hinge that's as small as possible while still printing consistently. Uh, to start off the physical testing modeling process, we made a bunch of small prototypes. Um, we're pretty conservative when it comes to making things. We weren't about to just like go make a giant dress to start out with. So we started with making a, just a necklace, crumpling that up and printing it, which worked. So we scaled up to uh, taking a really bad connect scan of me and then using that to generate a belt. And we crumpled that up uh, and printed it and that worked. So then we scaled up again. <coughs> which is when we started to have a lot of problems because it turns out a simulation that is robust enough to fold a structure that has hundreds of interconnected rigid bodies is not robust enough to fold a garment that now has over a thousand unique interconnected rigid bodies. Um, so as we're going along with our sort of scaling up and trying to figure out like fit and comfort and durability, we had a lot of issues with also uh, completely having to rebuild our software and code everything from scratch and try out different physics simulations until we found something robust enough and fast enough to accurately simulate things with thousands of interconnected components. And so all of these initial prototypes were also created in sort of in-house software that we use that essentially has no user interface. It's like a black screen that we press keyboard buttons in order to make it do things. But ultimately what we want is 
for anybody to be able to design their own garment that's custom fit to them. So while working on the sort of physical side of things, we're also working on the digital design side of things. So this is an app that once again runs in the browser on WebGL and allows people to sort of sculpt and design their own dress. They can change the silhouette and they can also change the structure, designing kind of different sized panels and then painting on panel styles, whether it's sort of more porous or more structured, more three-dimensional. And any design made for one person can also be kind of adapted to another. And so one of the kind of challenges in this design side of things that we came across is dealing with bodies and how do we actually digitally capture these things. So we have this kind of proliferation of scanning devices in depth cameras, most famously the Microsoft Connect, where it's like, oh, now these things are in everybody's home. People can just scan themselves and we'll make a dress. But it doesn't really work like that. These processes tend to be very glitchy. There's lots of like holes where things are shadowed. And perhaps more importantly, you know, how do you understand this geometry? You need to know what part of a body is somebody's arm and what part is their torso. And additionally, you don't know necessarily how somebody's going to be posed when they're scanned. And so while we were working on this, we actually met a group of people that were solving this problem called Body Labs, which sort of is a research group that created a system for making parametric body models based off of scan data. So they have kind of a machine learning algorithm that creates a parametric model, which is kind of consistent every time it's posable, and they can fit arbitrary scan data from different sources, whether it's a depth camera or a laser scan to this model. And then we can use that to adapt any design we create to any body. They were actually just acquired by Amazon last year and no longer exist, which is very sad. <laughs> Uh, but sort of another facet of the program of the project that we had to work on, which is really the cornerstone, is this simulation. Can we simulate the behavior of these complex structures in order to reduce their size for printing? Um, while we initially just conceived of kind of taking our garments and crumpling them up into a ball to fit them in the printer, when it came time to actually print one, we realized that that really wasn't the most efficient way to pack something into a printer. It would fit into the printer that way, but it was still using up like the entire print volume of the largest EOS SLS machine that they make. Um, so it was going to be very expensive to make them. Turns out that we all already know what the answer to the best way to pack things into a box is. It's how you pack when you're gonna go on a trip and you wanna put a shirt in your suitcase or you're putting things away in your dresser. You actually just want to fold them uh, or possibly roll them up in a way that makes sense. So we developed this tool called Kinematics Fold, which allows us to uh, fold these garments in order to fit them in the printer. We can also use this tool to sort of have a feedback mechanism with the design process. So as we're designing these textiles, which have these highly non-uniform behaviors, we can simulate how they're gonna drape and move, and then use that to adjust the design of the garment. This video shows the day that we printed our first dress, uh, which was printed on a SLS machine at the Shapeways factory in New York City. This was a really stressful day for us, um, so pardon us when you see us like being really nervous in the video. <laughs> we had a really weird thing that happened to us. We met a curator at the MoMA Museum, at the Museum of Modern Art, Paula Antonelli, who's one of the design curators, and she had seen the concept video that I showed earlier on the black background with the dress wiggling around, and had contacted us and said she was interested in acquiring a dress for the permanent collection of the museum. But the weird thing was we'd never actually made a dress, and we really didn't know if it was gonna work, but I just sort of told her like, yes, I'll definitely make you a dress, this is great, without really telling her that like it might completely not work. Um, so the day that they pulled this out of the machine at Shapeways was actually the day before they needed it for this super important acquisitions meeting that only happens twice a year. So we were very nervous. Um, and even like throughout the 
time this video was being filmed, we couldn't really tell if it was going to work yet. I couldn't actually tell if it was going to work until my friend came over and tried it on. And I was like, oh my god, it worked. So it was very exciting. And this was the first dress we ever made. So this is sort of the final dress. Same thing, just dyed black. And it's a uh, custom fit, intricately patterned structure with more than 200 2,200 unique panels connected by 3,300 hinges, and it's all printed as a single piece. And while each component is rigid in aggregate, sort of moves and flows with the body, and unlike a traditional textile, it's not uniform, so it varies in rigidity and porosity and drape. And it's completely customizable, which I think for us was the most important thing about this project of thinking about how to leverage some of the tools we have with simulation and computation in order to enable more personalization and customization rather than pure formal exploration. We've continued working on this project now for, I don't know, I think we started in 2013. So for a few years now and done sort of many different variations on the dress and on different ways the structure might be configured or skinned with different types of elements. This is one that we made uh, sometime later that's inspired by petals and scales. It has just the same underlying structure but is skinned differently. These ones actually can't be folded because the way uh, the scale geometry restricts folding, but they can be rolled up. So for these ones, we have a new simulation that rolls them only in one direction, sort of like a cinnamon bun, uh, to find a smaller configuration. All right, well, we'll motor through this New Balance project because apparently you've already talked to them. So we're also working with New Balance to develop performance footwear that can be 3D printed and sort of looking at how can we use additive manufacturing to make shoes that potentially perform or fit better. And so one of the sort of parts of this project that's a bit of a departure for us is that it focuses a lot on data. So they have sort of a sports research lab where they collect all kinds of data from runners. This is an example of pressure data where there's a series of sensors, both kind of in the bottom of the shoe, but also inside. So two sets of sensors, one that touches the foot, one that touches the ground. And how can we kind of use that data to guide design? So here is a series of sketches that we did, kind of looking at different ways to interpret this pressure data. Ultimately, sort of the structures that we're making now are based on variable density foams, kind of inspired by other variable density structures that you see in nature that kind of adapt to stresses. And so this system is based on a technique called optimal transport to make a variable density Voronoi structure that is centroidally optimized so that kind of the shape of each cell is kind of taking up the most volume with the least amount of structure. Uh, so these are two different midsoles that were customized for different styles of runner. So the runner on the left was from a data set that was from somebody who has a midfoot strike, and the runner on the right was from somebody who has a heel strike. And those are the resulting midsoles that were generated for those two people. Um, we've been working on this now, I guess, for two years, maybe possibly even longer than that. And unfortunately, most of the things we make, we never actually get to show anybody because they're not released. Um, but this is a demo that we made uh, last summer um, for a real-time design tool that the end use customer would use. Um, so this lets people go through a process of inputting their data, uh, physically sculpting the 3D mesh of the shoe to give different performance qualities like stability or um, padding on the midsole and then generating the structure for 3D printing uh, in real time as they are using the app. So finally, for this last little bit of section, we're going to do something that we don't normally do, which is show a bunch of different unfinished projects. And the sort of idea is to kind of show more how our thought process works and what goes into a project from our end. 
and there, there's lots of kind of weird little asides and dead ends, and it may end up being a little bit rambling, but hopefully that's okay. So our work is kind of a tangled web of different projects, themes, and techniques that intertwine over many years, where seemingly unrelated things can end up with important influences over what we're doing. And this is sort of a projects, themes, and techniques map of some things that we worked on in the last year. So we're going to start kind of with one project that is sort of at the end of all of these different sort of threads and work our way backwards. So this is a project that we did with Formlabs for the launch of their new SLS printer called the Fuse One. And we created a chainmail bodice that is printed as a single piece. And you know, in kind of a normal way that we might present this project, it's kind of a natural continuation of our work with 3D printed clothing and kinematics. And that is kind of true, but also in terms of the kind of inspiration and technique that goes into it, it's completely unrelated. So Form Labs had kind of approached us and they were like, it'd be great for you to make something for a new printer and could we make a 3D printed garment? And we were like, no way, because their printer is like a tenth the size of the printers that we normally make things on. And there was no way we could fold a kinematics dress small enough to fit in their printer. But after thinking about it, we thought, well, a chain metal structure is much looser, much less structured. And so we can actually compress it a lot more. And maybe we could print one of those as a single piece in their printer. And we had, in fact, played around with this idea when we were first working on kinematics before we'd ever printed our first dress, where this is a structure based on the same exact triangle structure of the kinematics dress, but it's articulated instead as each triangle is a link, and then the dual structure of those triangles creates another set of links that connects all the triangles. We tried simulating some of these, uh, like at the same time we were making the original dresses, and it was a complete failure because this has like 10 times as many pieces as a dress. Our simulation just couldn't handle it, and it exploded, and it was a complete disaster. So we sort of shelved that. I didn't think about it for many years. Part of the issue is that a chain mail structure is actually in many ways much more complicated. Every single link itself is simple, but there's an order of magnitude more links in chain mail than in the kinematic structure. And we actually have a very simple representation of the kinematic structure. We can have each triangle is just a wedge, and then they're connected by kind of idealized hinges. Whereas for chain mail, there is no sort of idealized constraint connecting two links. It's just all collision based. And in fact, rigid body solvers are primarily based around collisions between convex bodies. And a link is kind of the opposite of a convex thing. It's just a hole. And so when we tried to use kind of traditional solvers, they would just explode. So ultimately, what this boils down to is that rather than being based on this kinematic system that we'd created, this new structure actually sort of has a lineage that's more connected to our projects that deal with flowers or mushrooms and, these, and foams. Oops. So it starts uh, from our fluoroform project that we showed you earlier in the lecture. Um, what you see on the screen now is a chandelier that we made for the World Expo in Astana uh, last year, um, where we're sort of trying to combine some of our simulations together. We have a kind of fluoroform simulation, that's the base layer that's growing the overall shape, and then a hyphae simulation that's growing on top of that to create the structure. Um, so in some way, it's our most literal plant-like creation yet because we have a leaf simulation and a venation simulation running together. So fluoroform was based on a simulation technique from this paper called Discrete Shells, which is an early paper about simulating sort of elastic membrane structures from a kind of loose group of research that's known as discrete differential geometry. 
So this is kind of a bunch of researchers at different institutions. There's actually a group here at ETH called the Interactive Geometry Lab that does a lot of similar work that's sort of about taking the mathematics of differential geometry and trying to kind of create simulations that's more directly related to that mathematics. And they have a lot of really impressive research, but also a lot of really interesting and beautiful ideas. And so when we were looking at the various research from this group, we also came across another paper called Geodesics in Heat by Keenan Crane. And this sort of was another piece that went into how fluoroform works. It's a way of computing geodesic distances on surfaces that takes a very different approach to how this has been done before, where it uses diffusion to compute distance in a sort of approximate but very efficient way that allows us to kind of recompute the distances from growth areas at every single step of the simulation. It's a really fast way to calculate distances on surfaces, which is normally computationally really slow, which means that people don't do a lot of things on surfaces normally that are accurate. And so when we come across kind of really interesting research like this, we often keep tabs on the research group and what else they sort of come out with in the future. And so a couple of years later, same researcher came out with another paper called Stripe Patterns on Surfaces which sort of gives you a way of generating a set of lines on an arbitrary surface that follows a specified direction field with constant spacing. And so, do you want to go ahead? So we're very interested, obviously, in the structure of textiles and thinking about new ways to create fabric and clothing. So our first idea... You're jumping ahead here. I jumped ahead here? <laughs> sure. Which part are we on now? It's too many complex ideas in this lecture. Oh, anyway. oh, it's your best joke. Okay, fine. fine. Wow. <laughs> Way to ruin it. Look, okay, corn armadillo. That's the joke. <laughs> this is the actual figure that the author uses in the paper to illustrate the use case of this amazing stripe method he created. Corn armadillo. SIGGRAPH community is a weird place. <laughs> <laughs> so for us, it sort of reminded us more of like the structure of mushroom gills. And we were really intrigued by it, and we didn't necessarily know what we wanted to do, but we just were like, okay, what can we make with a sort of controllable stripe pattern? So uh, we're very interested in textiles and fabrics, so we started thinking about maybe how to turn it into a weaving system. Um, so what if we could generate these uniform distance stripe patterns on arbitrary surfaces, then we could generate uh, sort of very non-traditional weaving patterns that follow direction fields on any surface. Uh, that could be turned into some sort of 3D printed textile. So rather than having kind of a consistent warp and weft, this warp and weft kind of moves around and divides you know, these weird branch points. But then after working on this for a little bit, which we, we did print a few samples, but not the most sort of practical structure. And you can't really fold it like you can kinematics because it's rather than being sort of based off of the structure moving it's based on elasticity and so we can't print something bent and then have it unbend because it just wants to be bent that's an early printed sample but we realized that we could use kind of the same idea to design chainmail structures so it's kind of the same sort of thing as the weaving, but instead of sort of the lines uh, oscillating up and down, we take kind of the intersection points of each direction and make that into a link and then rotate each link around the line that it is based on to create this interlocking structure and the sort of alternating sets of lines for the alternating directions of rotation of the structure. Which lets us turn any surface into a chain mail structure of sort of arbitrary density in different areas. So this design path so far has been somewhat winding. We've started with uh, foam structures. No. No. We started with fluoroform. <laughs> 
Started with four. Now we're going into foam structures. <laughs> started with flowers. We moved on to story patterns, and that reminded us of uh, weaving patterns, which got us to chain mail. So this is sort of how we generate the structure, but then we still have to figure out how do we simulate it. Obviously, we love all things that are cellular. Basically, anything I make is generally has some sort of holes in it. Um, but we never really played with 3D cellular structures until we started working with New Balance. I think partially because it's just very generic and you see it everywhere, but in certain cases it ends up being sort of the absolute most efficient structure for certain types of applications. Um, we got pretty interested in thinking about how we could vary these structures through space to have more control over the patterns, uh, both in terms of size and anisotropic uh, types of structures. So one of the things we started playing with is a 3D printed porcelain tea set. So this is a 3D printed ceramic based on resin printing using SLA on a Formlabs printer. And so it's fired just like traditional ceramics, but instead of burning out moisture, you're burning out resin. In the design, we sort of replaced the handles that you'd have on your teapot or your cup with a cellular structure that lets you uh, safely grip it and stays cool. So it's sort of like a play on double-walled surfaces. We also ended up translating that into a jewelry collection um, called Corallaria, which plays with these sort of anisotropic, uh, centroidally constrained Voronoi patterns. These pieces were uh, made out of photochemically etched brass, which is a very sort of efficient and super cost-effective way to make very intricate things uh, that are small out of metal. It's how they make circuit boards, uh, but we use it extensively to make jewelry. So then, in addition to sort of varying these structures in density and directionality, we sort of wanted to play with other types of sort of functional ways that we could vary foams. And so one thing we started looking at is oxetic structures. So a lot of sort of Work has been done looking at oxetic structures in 2D, but much less so for like fully 3D structures. And a lot of the things that you see are much more mechanical. They're less sort of elastic based and much more like a Hoberman sphere, which is sort of one of the quintessential oxetic structures, which essentially means it has a negative Poisson ratio. So instead of something, a normal material, if you squeeze it one direction, it expands the other direction because the material has to go somewhere. But in an oxetic structure, when you push one way, it shrinks in every other direction, or if you pull one way, it pulls in all directions. While researching oxetic foams, we read this weird paper which describes how people uh, like actually manufacture oxetic foams. Um, and it's this really strange procedure where they actually just make a normal open cell foam using traditional process of like bubbling gas through another material. Um, but then afterwards, they do a strange deformation process where they reset the foam after buckling it, and that produces an oxetic foam. So we had the idea that what if we could do the same operation, but in simulation? And rather than kind of compressing it and using that to have the structure buckle, what if we instead grow the sort of foam lengths and cause that to buckle? And can we grow things variably to create kind of variable buckling? And so we sort of went back to looking at this body of research of discrete differential geometry, which has another method for simulating elastic rods from this paper. And we sort of did some early experiments with growing elastic rods, see what would happen. but we had some sort of stability issues where the way that you connect multiple rods together is actually kind of a completely separate kind of constraint mechanism. And when we were connecting lots and lots of different rods together, we had some problems, which is probably just my fault, not actually the method's it's fault. It's all your fault. <laughs> so we started to look for other ways that people have simulated elastic rods, where this- Like slinkies. <laughs> This was another paper we came across, which uses a method called position-based dynamics, which is kind of an interesting simulation technique, which kind of replaces traditionally like forces that you might use to simulate 
physical things with constraints. So just pure kind of geometry. And it kind of sacrifices accuracy for speed and stability. So the exact numbers of how things deform might be different, but the character is basically the same. And this was sort of scalable enough for us to start playing with these structures. We started with just a very regular grid because we figured we knew what that should look like to see if it would produce the right type of structure, which it basically did, but we really haven't quite tuned it enough to get the sort of auxetic functionality that we want. And so we kind of have shelved this as a potential area of research that doesn't actually have any application. But while we were playing with this, we had kind of released this new puzzle uh, the year before last called the Infinite Galaxy Puzzle. And it's a puzzle based on the topology of a Klein bottle. So like a Klein bottle, it has it's not orientable. So the bottom and the top surface are actually the same surface. So a piece from one side flips over and connects to the other side, forming a continuous image from the bottom to the top. And it has no border, and you can sort of start anywhere. So this kind of went unexpectedly viral and had like millions of views on Facebook. And so we were suddenly like really in the puzzle business. <laughs> and so we had started to think about like, well, we should make more puzzles. And we want to make a new kind of cut style because we had been making that same cut style for like five or six years. And while debugging this sort of auxetic foam structure, we sort of did it in 2D to see what was going on. And we kind of let it grow a little bit too long until it kind of intertwined and filled space completely. But we realized that this would make a really cool interlocking structure for puzzles. And so it kind of became our new puzzle system. And last year, we released these new geode puzzles that are the image and shape is inspired by agates. And then the cut system is this sort of deviation of our auxetic structures. So obviously, every single puzzle is different. They always have a different image as computer generated. They have a completely different shape. The pieces inside the puzzle are also totally com computer generated. And then somehow over this Christmas time, this couple months ago, we ended up having to make thousands of completely one of a kind, every single one is different geode puzzles in time for Christmas delivery, which was super fun. <laughs> We make these. In fact, I think, I think sing a certain audience member ordered one of these puzzles and contributed to my extreme amount of work <laughs> that I had to do <laughs> during the holiday season. But it's really exciting for us to take some of the ideas we have about generative products and actually like make them and have them succeed and have them reach thousands of people who now have a one-of-a-kind piece of nervous system art that they can play with with their kids and grandparents. So that's actually really exciting for us. All right, back to chainmail. <laughs> Somehow this comes back to the chainmail. So we had been working with kind of all these line-based simulations for these elastic rods and using these position-based dynamic methods, which were really robust and fast and great. And we were sort of like, well, you know, a chainmail structure isn't really like a solid. It's really more like lines. So if we can just treat it like lines and use these same methods that we've been developing for jigsaw puzzles for simulating our chainmail structure, it's going to be a lot easier than the methods that we've used in the past. And so this was sort of the first quick test of this idea, and it actually worked way better than I thought it would. And even sort of the whole thing hanging off a single fixed point, which is often very unstable in a simulation, worked. And so we were able to kind of scale this to fold our bodice as a single piece. Well, 
unlike kinematics, which actually requires us to fold things to be efficient, this we can actually really just crumple it up and put it in a box. And we fit the entire bodice in less than half the build volume of the form printer. How's about the build volume of a bread box? So it's the whole thing sort of just like wads up in your hand, which is super satisfying. So, whoops, go back. Ultimately, you know, the sort of progression of how do we create this chainmail bodice isn't really about like a project that is focused on, you know, we want to make 3D printed chainmail clothing. It's really kind of this journey of all of these different things that we're interested in whether it's sort of fabrication focused things to natural processes to simulation techniques and creating this sort of chain mail garment is really just kind of a one kind of stopping point along the way and that everything is really continuous and interconnected as we develop our sort of inspirations and also our knowledge and techniques that we can use. So since uh, at least two audience members have essentially already seen us give this exact same talk before, <laughs> we thought we would include just a few sneak peeks of some things that we're currently working on, um, including our first large-scale structure, uh, a new jewelry collection that is inspired by the form of sponge coral reefs that are in the deep ocean, a uh, new chandelier, uh, similar to the one I showed, but a different direction, 3D printed living tissues in a collaboration with Rice University, uh, looking at 3D printing living cells, um, 3D printing on pre-stretched fabric to generate predetermined forms from arbitrary surface meshes, and a new infinite puzzle. Thanks. So that was kind of long, um, but if anybody wants to ask any questions about anything, we're happy to answer your questions now-ish or later if you're too shy. Brave person. Do we need to pass the mic? Thank you so much for your for your presentation. I really enjoyed your work, and uh, I think also everybody in the audience knows your projects and um, your long contributions to to pretty much everything we do. Um, but I wanted to ask um, what in the last slides where you actually showed uh, also a bigger sculpture you're doing. Um, which is very different from most of your work because you work in a different scale. Um, what kind of n other challenges are influencing the design process you are, you're dealing with? So from all these inspirations you mentioned, I guess there's a whole new dimension of just thinking about forces and, uh, and uh, you know, use cases of these things. Um, how, how do you encounter this challenge? Well, I don't know if it's we really approach it all that differently from how we approach any of our other work. So that is going to be made out of sheet metal. So it's going to be a sort of a panelized structure that is assembled from flat panels. I guess it, it has a lot of the same sort of things that we would deal with, whether it's like some sort of computational geometry method for how we make these panels and sort of trying to incorporate fabrication constraints. Do you, have, do you have a better answer? Yeah, I mean, I think what Jesse's trying to say is like it, it's a lot of the same problems we have when we just like make things that are smaller. I mean, obviously at a different scale, like when I make a piece of jewelry and it's manufactured poorly, it doesn't like collapse and kill someone. So it's like a different scale of problem. But we have like manufacturing problems that happen when we're making small things and have to work around constraints that have to do with fabrication and materials and repeatability. And certainly on the bigger scale project, we're dealing with different processes that we hadn't used before. and 
some issues we hadn't encountered before, but it's a lot of the same types of things go into it. Now we have to deal a lot with uh, algorithms for flattening things, algorithms for determining the best panel shape that has the least distortion, figuring out how to generate the right number of rivet points that aren't gonna be too aesthetically disruptive, but also are gonna be very stable, and dealing with how it's anchored to the ground, and it's gonna be in a public park where kids are gonna be around, so there's a lot of like, kids are gonna climb on it, and like what's gonna happen that we don't normally deal with, and that's exciting, but yeah, it's, it, we normally don't make things that big, so it's also stressful. Hi. Um, have you actually tried to uh, break one of your dresses on purpose to see how much it holds? And would they actually accommodate, like, if someone gains some weight, like, how do you handle that? <laughs> well, I don't think gaining weight is necessarily going to be a problem. Because it doesn't really, like, bear your weight. You're bearing its weight. We did some just initial testing that wasn't very rigorous on kind of different thicknesses and hinges and when they would break from not precisely measured different amounts of force. And typically we don't intentionally try to break things. Unfortunately, sometimes random people intentionally try to break things. It's sort of like, I don't know, it's like a 3D printing thing. Whenever somebody is at like a 3D printing expo, there's like some percentage of people that walk up to it and are like, how easily can I break this? <laughs> Which is kind of an odd behavior, you know? It's like you don't walk up to a lace dress and then like grab the hole and try to rip it open, which you probably can do. I don't know if that answers your question, <laughs> really, but. Uh, thank, wait. thank you for presenting the great and very attractive work. So I'm curious, in the process you talked about, you change from the tensilation of the triangles for the dress, you change from the tensilation triangles to the chains because you cannot simulate to fold it small enough for the 3D printings. And I'm curious, like, do you only use simulations, I mean the same techniques for the chains you'll show later, or do you use an opt optimization process to try to find a, a foldable path that from a dress to a target shape? Thank you. Yeah, we just essentially do a heuristic simulation and we don't do any sort of optimization. It actually shares a lot of similarities with like protein folding as a problem in terms of the kind of constraints that you have to solve, which is like a famously impossible problem. So it's not really practical to try to do. <laughs> um, but I mean, we can fold the first ones, just to clarify. We do fold the, the triangulated ones, um, but we had to build a different simulation to fold the chainmail ones because they're considerably more complicated. Well, but they're also, the, the triangle-based ones are just a lot more constrained, so. There simply isn't a smaller configuration. And in fact, if you were to try to do it kind of in an exact way, it actually is harder because if you kind of treat the hinges as being perfectly stiff and just like pure folds, then it's, it's even stiffer as a system. But actually, there's a lot of play in the hinge so there's actually a whole process that we do where we fold it with a certain amount of error and then re-correct the errors in the fold to make a printable configuration. Uh, you guys started, first thanks for the lecture, it was very inspiring. Uh, you guys started in 2007 and like 11 years later, uh, in terms of method, uh, what has changed? Uh, or how have you progressed in terms of uh, 
developing libraries, the way you code right now, or just if you explain the method about that, the methodology. It's a broad question, but it's interesting for us. I mean, I don't feel like I have a very good answer. In 2007, we knew a lot less stuff, <laughs> and our methods were much more simpler, much, much, much simpler. Uh, all the projects that we first started with were 2D, for instance. So much has changed, like just in the years since 2007 to now, there were no desktop 3D printers. Nobody knew what 3D printing was. There was no WebGL. Uh, JavaScript was not really being used to create online applications. The first tools that we made in 2007 were uh, old school processing applets that were embedded in the browser and they were like tiny little user interfaces which are frankly quite terrible and if I ever show you any screenshots of them you would be like shocked at how bad they are. <laughs> but I think still they were the first online configurators that anybody had ever created for products um, that were on the internet. They were like crazy bad Java applets we made. And since then we've gotten a lot more sophisticated. We're much, uh, I don't know if we're better programmers but we know a lot more about computational geometry and contemporary computer graphics methods and now we have JavaScript and WebGL and many more powerful tools for the web. And even just processors and graphics cards have gotten so much better that it expands what we can reasonably do and design that wouldn't have been possible in 2007. And certainly like making 3D printed products wasn't really possible in 2007 because things were either too expensive or too brittle and fragile. You know, like, you know, we were printing on Z-Cores at school, which you're never going to make a 3D printed Z-Core product because there's just not a good material. And nobody knew what 3D printing was. When we first made a 3D printing product, like we would explain to people that it was 3D printed. They'd be like, I don't understand how this can come out of a printer. Is it like <laughs> made of paper? And it's like completely changed. Now everybody thinks they know what 3D printing is, even if they only think that it's FDM. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, it's pretty hard to say how we've changed, but like we were both kind of still kids when we started, and we were in school, and then we dropped out of school and started a business, and we knew nothing about starting a business. So <laughs> the amount that we've learned in that time is kind of immeasurable. We went from knowing nothing to knowing enough to keep going for like 11 years, which is a fair amount. Thanks for the really awesome presentation. Um, I know a lot about your work from your website, which is really awesome. But I was wondering, while you were giving your presentation, you were showing all these really awesome mathematical models and scientific models. I was wondering if there's any way we can, you've got all of this centralized somewhere where we can have a look at the methods you used, or even better, the source code that you have. Um, just a question out, just in case there's something somewhere on the internet which could help us out a lot. I mean, essentially, we're like not organized enough for that. <laughs> we have, you know, a giant Dropbox of research papers that are relevant to things, which are mostly completely unorganized, and probably half of which we haven't read. And our code is like completely all over the place. And we don't do a good job of encapsulating things as like reusable pieces, and like our projects usually don't even have like a completed branch. Like we have things in GitHub now, which is a big step up, but at the same time, we'd like use GitHub completely improperly. And <laughs> there's like a project has like 20 different branches, which all have different little tweaks to them, some of which really ought to be together. But then we're like, where was the, didn't we fix this? It's like in some other branch that isn't the current branch. So the but, answer is yeah. Just just the the answer is no. There's not <laughs> anywhere that you can see our code right now. Like for our online applets, you can obviously like right click on the screen and say view sorts, so you could like read that code. Um, I think this is actually something that we've been struggling with for many years. The question of like how much of our work should we open source or should we devote time to developing libraries that other people can use, and. It's something that we like intellectually want to do, but we're just two people who design and program and make everything that you've seen Nervous System make. It's just made by like 
us, essentially. So then time that we take to develop an open source library is time that we essentially don't get paid and don't focus on the work that actually like make sure that we can pay our staff and stay independent. So then we struggle with that. And I'm sure everybody here will at some point have to struggle with that as well. How do you take time to do like an open source project when you also have to make money? But we may eventually get to that. I feel like it's getting time where some of our things now are so old, we might as well just open source all of them because whatever, so. <laughs> But don't expect the code to be easy to read. <laughs> Thank you, Jessica and Jesse, for a fantastic lecture. And you started at the beginning that it feels like a lifetime since the last time you were here. I think what you showed looks like several lifetimes. No? Uh, may I have a quick question because you have this long experience of co I yeah. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I will not repeat again. <laughs> no, but uh, I have a question because you have this long experience of co-creation, uh, creating software that users can use, and so do you learn something about the taste of the people using your your tools or? Yeah, I mean, we, we learned similarly a lot of things about co-creation, about making tools that are easy to use and not too daunting, but open-ended enough. And we have a whole other lecture we sometimes gives that's entirely just about that and like what we've learned about how to make good online tools, which I don't even think we're necessarily making yet, but I have a better idea about how I would actually make them. You know, <laughs> a lot of times people, I feel like, have an attitude of like, normal people aren't interested in design or they just want to like, pick things or there's like this whole, you know, the whatever, this like people are daunted by too many choices, which I think is basically not true. It's just like really hard to make good tools. And so if you make really bad tools and bad experiences, people don't like them. And we've gotten better at making good experiences that people enjoy engaging in. I, like Jessica said, I don't think we're there yet. And sometimes in terms of like, where do we spend our time? Do we spend our time developing new ideas or do we spend time making things more easily accessible? And there's like a balance between those things that we could do a better job of. Yeah, so I mean, a lot of different things that we've learned, it's good to have like different starting points, like the thing that's on the screen that we start with is always something that we can actually make, and it's like a intro thing, but it's really easy to customize it, either through some sort of like way you get sucked in, like you open the app, you think you're just gonna change the color and make it fit your size, but then you like just start making more and more changes, so it becomes almost like a game where people just get like drawn into the experience, but it's initially very like easy. Um, or having like different links on products on our site where you think you're just gonna go buy an off-the-shelf product, but there's like a customized button, so you also get sucked in. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think the experience of making these apps is essentially what you'd expect. Some people make amazing, beautiful things that I never thought to make that like I wouldn't have designed and I love them. And other people make horrible things that we would never <laughs> ever design and print. But like that turns out to be the thing that they really want. So I'm happy that they get to get the thing that they want and it fits them perfectly and, and that's fine and we make them for them. We don't like call based on like whether we like the things people make with the apps. There's plenty of space in there to make things that it turns out that I hate and that's cool. That's just part of making mass customized products. If there's no more questions, then thank you again very much for your presentation. Huh? I, I have to confess, I also own uh, one necklace since our last uh, visit in Boston. I think I couldn't wear it. I would break it now. <laughs> but I'm also very happy that you will join tomorrow the presentation of the MIS. There will be a lecture from Lay also before the, before the presentation of the MIS and afterwards in Upper Row, where you all will also have again the opportunity to, to uh, ask questions in a personal talk. Huh? Thank you very much. Thank you.